Westminster Abbey, once the burial place of kings and queens. But in the 18th century, a new breed was being commemorated, the imperial hero. Some of them very ordinary citizens who arguably shouldn't be here at all. Like Lieutenant General William Hargrave, depicted as a dashing youth rising from the grave as the last trump sounds. This spectacular tomb is one of the most distinctive in Britain, and it helped to change the standing of sculpture in this country. It was erected in 1757, and it's an illusionistic tour de force with all manner of dynamic flourishes. At the centre, the ecstatic Hargrave erupts from his tomb. The bearded figure of time with bedraggled wings thrusts the figure of death down into the abyss. And behind them, this immense pyramid shatters like a Gotham City skyscraper in a Batman cartoon. It looks that modern. It's a wonderful work of art, but in a sense, it's also a fraud because Hargrave was an 18th century non-entity. This piece is all about projecting the opposite of the truth, transforming a rascal into a national hero. Hargrave is said to have cheated his soldiers of their pay. He committed no heroic act. He didn't die in battle. He's only here because his family paid for it. Yet this virtuoso con trick heralded the reawakening of British sculpture after the centuries of slumber that followed the destruction of the Reformation. Sculpture was the chosen art of the British Empire in its heyday. Our sculptors could make their name and their fortune depicting the heroes of the day. Unlike most medieval statues, these were statements of imperial secular power. The empire was also a time of great inventiveness and startling variety. Driven by maverick visionaries, they pushed the art form to new extremes and made this a golden age of British sculpture. The 18th century saw the unstoppable rise of Britain as a major world power. Coming here in 1746, the Italian painter Giovanni Canaletto portrayed London as the vibrant capital of a new empire, outstripping his native Venice and rivaling ancient Rome itself. This was confirmed in 1763 when the defeat of France in the Seven Years' War signalled Britain's emergence as the leader in the race to rule the world. Just five years later, the Royal Academy of Arts was founded to shape the way that our imperial status was projected to the nation and across the globe. To do so, it looked to the sculpture of the ancient empires that Britain sought to emulate, Greece and Rome. This is the Royal Academy the public doesn't see. Its basement corridors full of plaster replicas of the ancient statues that sculpture students were once made to study. This is the life room of the Royal Academy schools where students come to study the human form from the model who'd normally be there and also from all of these casts, including this one, 
possibly the most famous erotic work of art from antiquity, known as the Venus de Medici. She was considered a miracle of art, so sexy, that Pope Innocent XI packed her off to Florence, supposedly because she aroused lewd behaviour. Gathering dust in the corridor, a cast of the magnificent Lauerkuhn, then considered a pinnacle of Western art. A Trojan priest fights two huge serpents, about to throttle him and his sons. Casts like this have fallen out of fashion in art schools since at least the 1960s, and many of them have been destroyed. But in the 18th century, when painters and sculptors still studied them, they had the thrilling quality of strange visitations from Europe's past. This was the era when British buyers, patrons and connoisseurs swarmed all over Italy, voraciously buying up antique statuary. The so-called Grand Tour was the mark of a civilised person. Many British Grand Tourists were classically educated and very rich. Buying ancient sculptures, they laid claim to the mantle of Imperial Rome. Here they are at the Uffizi in Florence, in a 1778 painting by Johann Zoffany. They marvel at paintings and at the original sculpture of Venus de Medici. As for having themselves represented, the Grand Tourists wanted to be portrayed, above all, in sculpture. Sculpture was seen as the preeminent art form, very much the art form that certainly British patrons wanted to be, um, to own, to collect, and, and to be commemorated in. It was more vivid than painting. Um, if you think of a marble sculpture, it's absolutely before you. So it had a, a sort of dynamism that you don't necessarily get in painting. And marble sculpture in particular was seen as having a sort of permanence. The British had a, a great admiration for Rome. Many of the men that you see portrayed in the late 18th and early 19th century are portrayed wearing togas. Wasn't that just seen as a bit naff? <laughs> it was seen as emphasising their power. Often it emphasised that they were statesmen, that they were international figures. Um, it emphasised that they, like the Roman portrait busts that they'd seen themselves when they went to Rome, might, in terms of their image, last forever. So not at all naff, no, no. <laughs> to look really important, it was best to look Roman or Greek especially if you were dead. At Westminster Abbey, draped in Roman robes, the greatest British scientist of all time. Meet Isaacus Newton. The formulae and instruments were new. All the imagery was ancient. the sanctification of a very British scientific hero. But it's by the Flemish-born Michael Reisbrack. There were few homegrown sculptors with anything like his skill. Until the end of the 18th century, Britain still relied very much on foreigners to revive the forgotten art of sculpture. It was an Italian who showed Britain how glamorous the profession of the sculptor could be. The son and grandson of Venetian stonecutters, Antonio Canova became an international star thanks to his dazzling marble sculptures. The dashing Canova was lionized when he visited Britain, where his works were in huge demand, and one of his greatest is in Edinburgh at the National Gallery of Scotland.
This version of The Three Graces is considered Canova's masterpiece, and it was commissioned by a Brit, the Sixth Duke of Bedford, for Woburn Abbey, his grand country residence north of London. The Duke had fallen in love with it after seeing a model for an earlier version in Canova's workshop in Rome. Canova often used diluted coffee to dull the surface of the marble, but for the three graces, the Duke wanted to keep the material looking pristine and bright, and the marble's flawless. Canova could make cold marble appear like soft flesh, quivering, sensuous. It looks as if it might yield to the touch. A friend said that Canova kissed and caressed the marble rather than cutting or chipping it, and this is downright sexy. No wonder that Canova enthralled the British sculptors of the day. At Woburn, in a rotunda that Canova helped design, the three graces were often lit by candlelight and rotated on a plinth to be fully enjoyed in the round. It was Canova who would inspire the first British master sculptor of the imperial era. The son of a London plaster cast maker, John Flaxman studied at the Royal Academy and worked for Josiah Wedgwood. He was determined to match the greatest of the ancients, whatever it took. Sculpture is a jealous lady, he said, and will not be courted by halves. While studying in Rome for seven years, he produced his first marble masterpiece for the vast Italianate villa of Ickworth House in East Anglia. On a warm summer's day, you have to shake yourself. Remember, you're not in Italy, but right in the middle of Suffolk. Built to display art treasures, Ickworth gives pride of place to Flaxman's The Fury of Athamas. Not the respectful portrayal of an imperial general, but the daring image of a crazed king from ancient myth, about to dash out his son's brains. I love the unapologetic chutzpah of Flaxman's sculpture. It's drenched in drama, full of passion and violence and that surging energy. Just look at the straining sinews and the bulging veins on Athamas's torso. Flaxman's attempting to trump one of the most famous, one of the finest sculptures of antiquity, the Laocoon, to which this is indebted. This is Flaxman's calling card. It's a manifesto saying, anything the ancients can do, I can do better. Some think that in the fury of Athamas, Flaxman overreached himself, but I find this colossal marble thrilling. It's a work about madness that's more than a little mad and melodramatic itself. As a sickly young child, Flaxman had taught himself the classics, shaping his strange, dark imagination. The Strang Room at University College London boasts examples of his drawings, which were reproduced throughout Europe. These are really, really wonderful. It's a book of Flaxman's illustrations of Dante. And right at the front, he signs it by John Flaxman's sculptor, but these are very, very crisp drawings. And it was these illustrations of the classics, of Dante and also of Homer, that made Flaxman famous right across Europe, just as famous as Turner. They look very, very modern. This one of Lucifer, such a bold image. It looks like it's come straight out of a comic book. 
and Flaxman drew it at the end of the 18th century. Flaxman was a true original who synthesized Christian and pagan, ancient and modern. He was a friend of William Blake who said admiringly, when Mr. Flaxman does any of his fine things, he does them in the spirit. His last great work, also at UCL, shows why Blake admired him so much. This is the original plaster model for Flaxman's masterpiece, St. Michael Slaying Satan. And it was discovered in his studio after his death in 1826. And you can see at once, it's a very grand, heroic composition with these two figures spiraling all the way around that strong central shaft of St. Michael's spear. And Flaxman's using the classical style to imbue a Christian story with a real sense of drama and pathos and grandeur. The figure of St. Michael has got very smooth, sleek forms, reminiscent of an Apollo, of a Greek god on Mount Olympus. He certainly meant this as a triumph of the neoclassical style, with those smooth forms vanquishing the more baroque, fleshly modelling of the satanic figure below. And some see this as a, an allegory of the spirit conquering the flesh. Flaxman himself believed that sculpture should elevate the mind to a contemplation of truth. But I feel that somehow, as a sculptor, he's complicit with Satan. You certainly feel that he's really relished modelling all these curls and wisps of hair on his head. Perhaps, as William Blake once said of Milton, Flaxman was on the devil's side without knowing it. This magnificent room, created by the Victorians in his honour, also houses memorials that bear witness to his offbeat beliefs. Like Blake, he was an ardent follower of Swedenborg, a mystic with eccentric notions about angels. The Swedenborgian idea was that you had two guardian angels who would escort you to heaven and that uh, angels were, had themselves been human. And so if you look at the, the person being taken up to heaven, she looks very like the angels who are es escorting her. And then you've got the uh, evil spirits and he's um, offering a crown, in other words, an earthly crown, and you notice that he's, in fact, transforms into a serpent, and he's, in fact, Satan. And so human life is a perpetual struggle between your, your good angels and your evil spirits. Sounds um, like something out of Philip Pullman. Well, it could be, yes. Far cheaper than his full-scale works, Flaxman's reliefs democratise sculpture in Britain. And in these often neglected works, so full of feeling, he humanised the memorial. What's really interesting to me is that Flaxman creates a kind of new language of mourning. If you think about what most 18th century monuments are about, they're about rank, they're about status, and they're, to some extent, about wealth and about power. Flaxman changes that equation completely. What you see in these is not simply the commemoration of a good life or a celebration of the person's rank, but the kind of emotional impact that he had on people. It's the loss, if you like, he commemorates rather than the, the, the life of the, the person. Flaxman made so many of these low price works, he died less rich than famous. But he'll always be remembered as a master craftsman who perfected techniques still in use today. Remarkably, the wood of this chair is actually marble. This 50s-style kitchen dresser is also marble, with alabaster handles. 
They're the work of Suffolk-based sculptor Kim Meridew. Kim. Hiya. How's it going? Very well, very well. Like Flaxman, to convert a clay or plaster model into marble, Meridew uses a pointing machine. This pointing machine is about uh, 150, 200 years old. This is 200 years old? Yeah. This, this Flaxman could have used it? He could have, it could have been in his studio, yeah. We're still the best way of transferring points in space onto, onto stone. Show me how it works. OK, so the pointing machine is fixed in three places on the model. Uh, we take a point using this movable arm. Say we choose this finger. This is to there. And then we slide it to the model. Tighten this up and then pull back the point. So we move the whole pointing machine from the model over to the block of stone that we're going to carve. And this fixes onto the three points that are kind of in relation to the, to the model. And we push this back in. We know that when this little nut touches this, that we've reached the point of the little finger on the model. So we slide it back and then we start to cut. Do you want to have a go? Yeah. OK, here's the hammer and bolster, here are the goggles. How hard is it? It's uh, not as hard as granite, but harder than alabaster. Do you want me to get it there? <laughs> right, that's a bit of the marble gone. That was a good 20 quid that I just knocked off. <laughs> that wasn't the thumb. You don't need that. No, still, we didn't need, I need that. You're still there. Yeah, in fact, that helps. See, it's a bit... It's easier now. Now you've got... <laughs> yeah. If you chip it all off... Look, it there's gets another easier. bit. So how... I mean, how close do you want me to go in? Otherwise, well, I, I might chip off the tip of the finger. Yeah, I, I, I'd go a tiny bit closer, just go another five mil. And five then... mil you want? Well, I can hear something's coming off. Hey! And that is the tip of the finger. I see. The pointing machine has got its limitations. It, it, it can only give you a point in space. So for you to be able to carve the thumb, for instance, you can't take a point over every piece of the thumb now, every turn of the skin. You have to do that with your own skill. And dexterity. Why, why can't I do it? Because there's too many points to take. It would take too long. And it wouldn't look very nice. It would probably just be a mess. <laughs> to achieve the work that Canova and Flaxman uh, uh, managed, you have to have uh, an enormous amount of skill uh, and uh, to be truly gifted. Do you admire them? Very much. Anyone that can achieve that in something as difficult as marble deserves a lot of respect. Georgian sculpture was much more varied than we might think, and Flaxman wasn't the only maverick of his day. One of his contemporaries achieved greatness by rejecting wholesale the pompous classical imagery then so in vogue. Completed in 1828, this statue of George IV depicts him as a contemporary king in modern dress, not as an ancient Roman emperor. It's by France's Chantry. From a poor background, he rose to become one of our great artists. Few have heard of him, but he should be a household name. A no-nonsense Derbyshireman, he was described by Sir Walter Scott as a right good John Bull, blunt and honest and open. A master portraitist, Chantry asked his models to chat to friends so they looked natural as he sculpted them. This is Chantry's bust of John Raphael Smith, who is one of his patrons. You can see Smith's lips are half open and his head's turned as if he's just trying to catch what you're saying. And that's because in old age, he went deaf and Chantry is reported to have said, if you observe a deaf man's mouth, you will always find the lips unclosed when he's attending to you. This is 
very simple and direct and compassionate. It's unpretentious, but somehow this relatively ordinary man has got the presence and the dignity of a hero. No togas, no Roman haircuts, just meticulous human observation, stunningly captured in marble. Chantry once said, with typical bluntness, I hate fine words, especially mawkish words like sentiment. But his work is full of real feeling. Not for nothing, the painter Benjamin Robert Hayden called him the greatest bus maker on earth. After a basic education at his village school, Chantry had started out as a grocer's assistant, but insisted on learning to carve. He didn't have a fine classical education, and he didn't spend long in Italy. I hate allegory and imaginary beings, he said, because they can never touch our heart. And his most touching work is in his home county at Litchfield. On a simple mattress, two young girls asleep. One holds a bunch of snowdrops. No allegory, no angels. The Robinson sisters had both died tragically young. In 1812, their mother commissioned this memorial from Chantry. There's no denying that it's a totally bravura piece of carving. There's superb observation. Just have a look at the way the drapery folds and flows over the legs of the children. And it's an incredibly realistic mattress. And I love the pillow, which feels squidgy and soft. The head is just dipping here, and you sense the feathers of the pillow inside pushing out against it. It really does feel like it can't be made of stone at all. And when this was shown at the Royal Academy in London in 1817, it caused a sensation, I think because Ordinary people responded to the new realism of these figures. An eyewitness wrote, such was the press to see these children that there was no getting near them. Mothers lingered with tears in their eyes and went away and returned. There was another work by Canova just nearby, but it was completely ignored. Lots of cathedrals have got Chantry statues and the detail is always there and you can always tell a Chantry statue by the amount of the, the detail in the mattresses, the fingers, the, just the work that he did was just superb. You know, if the girls were to get up and walk away, we could lie on that mattress and pillow and be quite comfortable. Bit cold. But it's a bit cold, but it's, it's perfection to me. It's absolutely gorgeous. But there is always a fault in his work, and under the toe of the eldest girl, there's a lump under the foot, just there. A lump of... A lump of stone that hasn't been carved. Oh, deliberately so? Deliberately, yeah. Uh, Chantry felt that only uh, God could do perfection. We always have flowers being left at this particular point. Quite a lot of mums come in, and if they've lost loved ones, leave flowers here in memory of them. By early in the 19th century, after spectacular victories over Napoleonic France, Britain's empire was well on the way to becoming the biggest the world had ever seen. Trafalgar and Lord Nelson soon became part of its mythology, celebrated in triumphant paintings, together with the Duke of Wellington's victory at Waterloo. Britain's sense of invincibility soon inspired some of the biggest, brashest sculptures ever made in these islands. The bigger the empire became, the bigger the sculptures got, reaching their peak soon after Victoria came to the throne in 1837. And you have to be impressed by their epic scale. This statue of the Duke of Wellington is at Hyde Park Corner, 
one of London's most famous landmarks. But in 1846, the triumphal arch here was topped off with a far bigger Wellington. By Matthew Coates Wyatt, this all-conquering duke rode the biggest horse in Europe. So big, it was said you could hold a dinner party in its stomach. But Queen Victoria didn't approve. So once the duke died, he and his mount were towed to Aldershot by Pickford's removals and later replaced by a massive bronze of winged victory descending on the chariot of war. Hoping to outdo the ancients with a British colossus, the versatile John Flaxman offered up this five feet high maquette of Britannia Victorious. His giant heroine was rejected, but if she had ever been installed at Greenwich, she would have looked something like this. 200 feet high, testimony to the hubris of empire when Britannia really did rule the waves. But you've got to hand it to them. Once the British started thinking big, they thought very big. And one colossus did come off. Nelson's Column. The 19th century was the great age of public sculpture and patronage. And this is the quintessential example of a heroic monument. Nelson was the Churchill of his day, a real people's hero. And here he's colossal, almost five metres tall, standing more than 45 metres high up above our heads. In fact, he's so high up, if you're anywhere near the base of his Corinthian column, you can't actually see him. in 1843 by Flaxman's favourite pupil, Edward Bailey, Nelson is the epitome of the victorious imperial hero. The four plaques at the base, each made from melted French cannon, commemorate Nelson's great sea battles, including Trafalgar. Lions weren't installed until 1867, 62 years after Nelson's death. And they were actually made by painter Sir Edwin Landseer, which was a commission that ruffled feathers among Britain's sculptors. The zoo provided the lion as a model. The poor creature died while Landseer was out of town, so he had to hurry back to work quickly from the carcass. As he wrote to a friend, anything as fearful as the gases from the royal remains, it's difficult to conceive. At first, Nelson's column was highly unpopular. The Art Union, an organisation to promote art, hated it so much that they hoped a strong wind would blow it onto the National Gallery, which they also loathed. Parliament was warned it might topple, but it never even wobbled. It's not great art, but as a patriotic monument, Nelson's column is one of the greatest British icons. It embodies the sheer exuberance of imperial sculpture. Not for nothing did Adolf Hitler dream of exporting the whole thing to Berlin. The streets and squares of the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, feature the civic statues of the 19th century. But alongside them is this work by a living sculptor. Alexander Stoddart believes classical is best. Hi. Hello. Hello, Alistair. So who is this bloke? It's a statue of our national poet, Robert Burns. 
not Robbie Burns, but Robert Burns. We don't say Johnny Keats and we don't say <laughs> Willie Wordsworth, so we don't say Robbie Burns. I didn't say anything. Yeah, I know, but just it's just an interesting take on it. It's an aside. Statuary is never a casual thing. It's never jocular. But you seem like you've got a good sense of humour. Oh, of course. But nothing is more annoying than a joke told twice, a joke told 24-7 for the next thousand years, well, it would, it would incline people to murder. So, for this reason, the stable and serious things of the world have to be themselves stable and serious. But isn't it your job as a sculptor to try and animate the form with some sense of energy? No. The job is to arrest the form for perpetuity. But if it is devoid of energy, it's devoid of interest. My statues in Edinburgh look best at the Edinburgh Festival, when the fringe people are jumping about in all sorts of antic activities. And the statue stands there, completely detached from it all, taking no part in it. That's what makes a statue successful, of course. The statue tries to stand or sit like, in, like a pool of silence and calm in the middle of all the general karaoke. And our cities are in need of these great outposts of silence that the statuary, particularly the 19th century, afford. Outposts of silence. Maybe that's what mid-Victorian sculptors hoped their numerous memorials to Prince Albert would be. And there is something magical about this one by John Steele in Edinburgh. The German husband of the Queen, Albert was largely unloved by the public, but he'd been a busy patron of art, design and industry, masterminding the Great Exhibition of 1851. When he died ten years later, the devastated Victoria commissioned a memorial so ornate it ranks as the zenith of all our imperial sculpture. Albert Memorial in London was completed in 1876. Its designer, Gilbert Scott, called it a fairy tale structure, and it is the most spectacular piece of imperial kitsch. Housed in a Gothic medieval style shrine, Albert gazes out like the lord of all civilization, past and present. Over 200 idealised figures, the work of 11 different sculptors, complete the picture. At the base, four continents, including Europe and Asia. Four giant friezes depict the arts. The sculptors range from the ancients right through to Antonio Canova, with his hand on the shoulder of the seated John Flaxman. Way above, the Christian virtues embodying the moral certainties of the day. What might have been a solemn shrine had become a celebration of imperial self-confidence. The masters of their universe, the Victorians saw all past and present art as raw material for their borrowings. In time, a new sculptural movement would arise from this grand tendency, which was epitomised by one of the wonders of the age, the cast courts at the V&A. In the words of one journalist of the time, they provided a capital refresher to the memory of the scattered sculptures of the continent, transforming the whole world into an enormous artistic playpen for the late Victorians. And of course, they could see all of these treasures without the inconvenience of actually having to leave London, the epicenter of their empire.
The cast of Trajan's column from ancient Rome dominates. Nearby, a replica of the 12th century facade of the cathedral at Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Victorian sculptors still studied the cast of the ancients, but now they expanded their frame of reference to include more recent glories. It was the Italian Renaissance that was most in demand. Works like this one by Donatello inspired British sculptors to look at the past in a new way and to play with a novel mixture of styles and materials. To see one of the first masterpieces of the movement that became known as the New Sculpture, I visited the Kensington Dream House of painter Frederick Layton. Famous for works like Flaming June and the Syracusan Bride. I prefer his home, all very magnificent and more than a bit strange. The sort of place where you never know what you're going to see next. Frederick Layton was a major force in British art in the final decades of the 19th century. He was a real operator, a networker, and he built this place, which is his home, this opulent Arab hall, to impress the great and the good of the British art world who came to visit him. Layton sculpted too, but his greatest contribution to the new sculpture was to promote a young genius, Alfred Gilbert, the last master of the imperial age. Leighton commissioned Gilbert's first masterpiece, inspired by the myth of Icarus and his disastrous flight too close to the sun. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Okay. Okay, go up on that. Now kept safe under perspex, Icarus adorned Leighton's hallway. Okay. That's it. Well done. Careful of that. And now to the floor. It's a bit dusty on top. Yeah. Very dusty on top. <laughs> Icarus has been called the most beautiful work in bronze made by an English artist in the 19th century, and you can see why. The Victorians were blown away by the exquisite naturalism. Just look at the superb details of the feathers of his wings, even the veins on his hands and his feet. Such fine modelling became a hallmark of the new sculpture movement. But what I love about it, though, is its humanity. Gilbert identified with Icarus. It flashed across me that I was very ambitious, he said. Why not Icarus with his desire for flight? As a result, Icarus isn't some remote, abstract figure from ancient myth. He's an anxious adolescent, aware of his talent, his capacity for flight, and on the cusp of a glittering future, but concerned that he could fail. He's looking down on the rocks below at a bird strangled by a snake, which Gilbert thought was a presage of our life. This may have been a commission, but it doesn't commemorate some illustrious general or some pompous politician. What it is, is something very new that set the tone for much British sculpture to come. It's intensely personal a haunting piece of autobiography. It's also a premonition of Gilbert's later spectacular fall from grace. As a young man, Gilbert had studied medicine and his knowledge of science informed his tireless experiments as a sculptor. To get all the surface detail he wanted, 
He cast his bronze Icarus using the lost wax method he brought to Britain from Rome. At the Royal College of Art Foundry in Battersea, sculptor Rose Gibbs is using the same technique to make a very modern bronze for her MA show. Lost wax involves making a wax model and then destroying it to make your bronze. First, sections of the green wax model are coated with plaster stucco. The stuccoed pieces are heated to more than 850 degrees centigrade. That's it. OK. The plaster survives, but the wax inside is well and truly lost, pouring out of the mould. Then comes the really dangerous part, and nowadays that means a lot of protective gear. Bronze ingots are loaded up, then heated in an underground furnace. And at around 1,100 degrees, they melt. If you lean over, you get this big jet of hot air that immediately comes up and it comes up beneath your visor. You don't want to stay there for very long. And then you look in, you can see the ingots are in there. And at the bottom, whoa. Oh, you can see a bubbling bit of orange. But it's scary. It's like a real energy and force in there. Heated up again, the plaster shells are put upside down in a sand pit. Oh, my God. The bronze is poured in fast before it cools and solidifies. And it's 1,100 degrees centigrade. And you see this bright, phosphorescent, fiery, molten liquid that was once a bar of metal that's been melted down and is now going into the moulds. Go on, bit more, bit more. Hey, keep going, keep going. Stop. OK. Gilbert once used this very technique. It's easy to think of his finished bronzes as quite genteel, very, very tasteful, and almost to overlook them. But there's so much energy going on here, because that metal's so, so hot, and it just feels like an elemental, powerful force. And that's what Gilbert, back in the day, he was grappling with that very thing. Oi, 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 slow up. OK. OK. Hey, that's Great. brilliant. Later, Rose Gibbs smashes off the plaster, leaving sections of hardened bronze. There'll be 86 of them to assemble into the final work. The mountain. Once wax, now bronze. Six feet tall and weighing about a tonne. Less a homage to Gilbert, more of a comment on heroic bronzes. This is the finished piece. Yes, this is mountain. At last. It's very noticeable that your mountain's penis... It, well, it's a penis mountain, really. <laughs> yeah. there, there are a lot of penises on the mountain. Yeah. Is that partly playing with that whole without being too po-faced about it, you know, phallic associations of bronze. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to play with those um, grand associations with um, great victories, kind of um, conquering of countries, um, winning of wars. So I have these um, penises to sort of symbolise uh, male virility and strength, but they're kind of de defunct on this mountain. They're kind of limp. If you take a look at these uh, penises just here, there's a lot of um, texture and detail. And the women have varicose veins and yeah. um, 
that kind of thing is something that um, is achievable with the lost wax technique. You get all that detail in there. In late Victorian Britain, it was all so different. Sculpture wasn't primarily about expressing yourself, and that was Alfred Gilbert's problem. His most famous work shocked his contemporaries because in it, he expressed himself too much. Unveiled in Piccadilly in 1893, Eros was boldly experimental. The statue was made of a recently invented metal, aluminium. But Eros isn't Eros, the god of romance. He's Antiros, the god of charitable love, a memorial to a Victorian benefactor, Lord Shaftesbury. Gilbert had outraged Victorian England by commemorating him with a naked youth bang in the middle of theatre land. Before long, the statue was condemned. A big satire, said one opponent, shocked that the Cupid-like figure had landed in a district known for theatres and loose morals and prostitutes. Soon there were jokes in the press about Eros burying shafts. Shopkeepers objected to all the ragamuffins they saw congregating on the steps. Punch magazine called it the very ugliest monument in any European capital. And after all the incessant meddling of the various committees involved in its creation, even Gilbert himself called it an utter failure. He blamed the committee's interference for the excessively broad base, out of proportion to the figure on top. Even worse, the airborne Antiros had ended up six feet closer to the ground than he should have done. It would be small comfort to Gilbert to learn it's now one of Britain's best-loved landmarks. And it had taken him so long, it set him on the road to financial ruin. Like Icarus, Gilbert was an overreacher. He needed a high income to sustain his studio, his family, and his taste for the high life. But gripped by his imagination, he seldom knew when to stop, and in sculpture, the overheads can be crippling. A chance for financial salvation came in 1892, when Gilbert was summoned to Windsor by the grief-stricken Queen Victoria. Her beloved grandson, the Duke of Clarence, had died of the flu at the tender age of 28. She commissioned Gilbert to make his tomb. Eddie, as she called him, was to be laid to rest in the royal family's private Albert Memorial Chapel, newly refurbished after Albert's death. The monument to the Duke of Clarence is Gilbert's masterpiece. It's a work of fantastic exuberance and complexity that blends elements of the 19th century Gothic revival with the high Italian Renaissance. It's also a bravura display of technical virtuosity, incorporating a wealth of different materials, as well as bizarre but engaging details. You can tell that Gilbert here really let his fertile imagination run totally free. On the ornate grill, a host of angels. Above them, 12 saints. Saint George, made of aluminium and ivory, extends his right hand in blessing. The Virgin Mary in a silver and golden robe is encircled with roses. But unlike Eros, this memorial isn't all that well known. It occupies this private chapel that's used exclusively by the royal family, and it's also marred by a single glaring quirk. In contrast to the tombs on either side, Gilbert's monument dwarfs its surroundings, and as a result, from the floor, you can only just glimpse the effigy of the Duke himself.
Dressed as an officer of the 10th Hussars, the prince is immortalized in bronze, brass, marble, and aluminium. An angel with a celestial crown welcomes the duke to paradise. But the saints brought about Gilbert's downfall. By 1898, he was going broke. Before the tomb was consecrated, he began selling off the saints at 250 pounds a throw. St. Michael is an original. Gilbert cheekily sold a replica. St. Elizabeth is a replica far inferior to the one he flogged. The sales led to his disgrace. He still went bankrupt. His life in ruins. In 1901, Gilbert smashed many of his models and left for exile in Belgium, saying, England be damned. The days of new sculpture were numbered. Gilbert fashioned all of the superb individual flourishes with the delicate concentration and care of a goldsmith. And really, they're more successful than the whole. Still, there's no denying the unique power of his vision. This tomb may be eccentric, but it is a masterpiece, and it's one that's drenched with the magnificent spirit of the 19th century. But by the time that Gilbert returned from self-imposed exile in Belgium in the 20s and actually put the finishing touches to this monument, elaborate sculptures like this already felt like relics from a bygone age. In the next episode... British sculptors break all the old rules in a golden age of innovation, they provoke controversy and scandal. The sculptor of a house who won this year's Turner Art Prize has watched her work being demolished. And they reinvent the very idea of sculpture.